This is Good Morning Mumbai, and you're with Rishi K. Radio One. Very pleased to have a, a special guest in studio. It's Anu Aga. Hi, ma'am. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, there is a friend of mine who attended one of your Inc. talks a couple of years ago, which was about invest in living your life. You have to give all of us today a sample of that, please. Uh, that was in Jaipur two mm, years ago. Correct. Where I spoke about the philosophy of life, and my main. thus was that we have to internalize the saying that our stay on this earth is short our roles dispensable and our impact in consequential so whether you are a ceo or a worker it doesn't matter if we have a swollen head and think we are the cat's whiskers it's not going to help us as individuals to grow and that you can cheat the whole world but you cannot cheat yourself and because there is a mirror which you look at all the time and look at yourself and i talked about some of the games i have played in the past and i will continue playing some of them are unaware <laughs> of how it's easier to pull someone down and be relatively a little high than really work and put yourself higher than the other person i also talked about death which i had to face of my husband and a year later of my son and how unless you get over these things world will go on people will sympathize you for a day for a month for a year but then you have to get on with life and find the meaning and do something worthwhile uh I also talked about it's funny but you may get over death but you still miss little things for example my husband was a great cuddler he used to cuddle me a lot <laughs> and i miss that tremendously or my husband son had a tremendous sense of humor and sometimes a sarcastic sense of humor but i still miss that so this was the essence of my talk beautiful in conversation with anu aga let's listen to some music when we come back uh, i'm going to ask her how she turned around the fortunes of a company uh, within a decade uh, those are lessons and learnings for all of us this is good morning mumbai and you're with rishi k Radio 1. I'm in conversation with Anu Aga. Now, as far as Thermax is concerned, I mean, uh, when you took over, I think it was 1996. It was literally in the doldrums at one point of time, and you pulled it out. And the entire reversal happened in a period of, of as short a phase as eight years. It's very difficult to put in in a couple of minutes what you did. But what is the underlying belief behind turning around the company? This was a legacy handed over by my father and my. husband who had slogged for the company and the belief was that I'll never let them down and I'll try my best but having said that it's not anuaga that turned around is the entire team and without the team there's no way I could have turned around i also believe that destiny was on our side and that's why we could pull around and pull through without that i doubt if we would have uh, just to give you an idea a year before my husband died we had gone public and our 400 rupee share had come down to 36 that's how much we had come down and we had the help of a consulting company and we divested out of many portfolios which added to our top line but eroded our bottom line we brought greater efficiency in the businesses we chose to say we reconstituted the entire board i don't think anywhere in india this has happened where earlier we had nine executive directors and four independent directors and family we decided to have five independent directors our ceo as the executive director and the family had to make the choice either they be on the board or have an executive position they can't be in both this was a tough choice for my daughter and my son in law who were used to running the business and they chose to be on the board we also became more customer centric which we were but when we were sliding that had gone bad and we brought back our innovative spirit so some of these things helped us to turn around and really this was the time when you were going through the worst personal crisis uh, that one could imagine so was getting to work every day a struggle or did the fact that you had to live up to the legacy spur you on to to higher glory you know after my husband's death i was so plunged into turning around that i had no time to think but 14 months later when my son died which i wasn't at all prepared my husband was 60 had a massive heart attack continued to be a smoker so somewhere behind my i felt some day this could happen though i was touching wood and hoping it would never but i think my son's death took a little toll and i decided to take time off for 15 days 
and uh, be with his friends who had come down from England to be with me. So I think that luxury I allowed myself of being away for 15 days. But then I said to myself, again, you can't wallow in self-pity forever. You have to get on with life. That's how I did. <laughs> the sunny disposition of Anuaga. Up ahead, uh, we're going to talk about her Teach for India. So don't go anywhere. This is 94.3 Radio 1. This is Good Morning Mumbai and you're with Rishi K. Radio 1. Anuaga is my special interview guest today and it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to uh, the lady. Teach for India. I mean, it's obviously the primary passion in your life right now and everybody who's involved with it or even people who are not involved with it are, are marveling at, at uh, the, the concept of it. When did it first come to you and when did you just devote, decide to devote your entire life to it? I'm devoting, not my life, but a chunk of my time and my resources. I thought you had given up uh, active work in Thermax. I have, I have, you have, have, but I still have other things. Yeah. Uh, so, for education of the underprivileged. And that also happens to be Akanksha and Teach for India and other advocacies or whatever I need to do for this course. So, about seven years ago, the CEO of Akanksha Shaheen Mystery talked to me about Teach for America. This is something America started 22 years ago. This is not our idea, but we came to know about it and we felt there is a great opportunity to do something in India. And uh, we went to McKenzie and we requested them to roll out a five-year plan. And then we mobilized people around it. And Shaheen left Akanksha and became the CEO of Teach for India. And she's the driving force. We are all supporting her, helping her. But I can't think of Teach for India without Shaheen. You'd be very happy to know that uh, I, I do some voluntary work too. When I'm off work at the radio station, I try and help uh, little kids be radio announcers because radio has just gone through the roof and all these kids at Akanksha, you know, they're listening to FM radio and want to be radio presenters. So. How lovely. And some of them are so talented, you of know. Of course. It's remarkable. Why I learned so much from them. I learned so much from them. Absolutely. You yeah. know, our kids had the best of opportunity. And in a private school, if a child fails and doesn't get to a university, everyone talks about it. Whereas in a government school, if one child makes it to university, there's a film made about her. Yeah. So we have such low expectation of our municipal kids. And I think that's sad. They have the potential like our kids. It's just that opportunity is not given to them. So Akanksha and Teach for India create this opportunity by making uh, studies interesting, fun. And they like to study. It's not a, they're not beaten, they're not humiliated. And a classroom is a place where they want to come. And we have no attendance problems, which most municipal schools have. And I think some of our fellows from Teach for India have been able to make a significant difference in the lives of people. In Akanksha, we had a girl from slums who, because of her influence of the teacher, went on to graduate and joined Teach for India as a fellow. Wow. And we take 7% of the people who apply. So Seema Kamble made it to Teach for India and now is a teacher in a, in a municipal school. Fantastic. More conversation with Anuaga up ahead. Uh, I'm going to ask her how much Mumbai has changed. You know, she's been seeing the city over the years and what we really need to have a heart for. This is Good Morning Mumbai and you're with Rishi K. Radio 1. Such a pleasure to be able to talk to Anuaga. This is a an exclusive conversation right here at 94.3 Radio 1. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, you have a, a karmic connection with Mumbai. You studied here. Yes. Didn't you? Yes. I married here. You I married had my a... first kid here. <laughs> but that was years ago. You don't live here anymore. You live no, in Pune. No, no. Mm. I lived in Pune for a longer period. Now, obviously, Mumbai has changed. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Uh, we, we actually ran a campaign at the radio station saying, uh, have a heart. So we asked people, what do, what do you think we should have a heart for? You know, people said garbage, people said littering. What do you think Mumbai needs to have a heart for? For those who are in slum or on the pavement, worse than slums even, is the pavement. They need to have a heart to do something for the city. We who are well-to-do uh, never campaign for planning a city where we cater to the poor. We have domestic help, we want workers, but we don't want to plan for them. So a building comes down and a high-rise comes up and there's no plan for rehabilitating the people whom we have displaced. We want them to go away miles away from us. They're considered eyesore. So I would like people to have a heart 
for people whom we push away from our lives and yet we need them in our lives how can we improve the quality of teachers everybody universally says oh my god the quality of teaching has gone down in this country you know pe- people who are well equipped are working in professional sectors not giving time to teaching what is the way around that i think the first thing we need to fix is the teacher training institutes unfortunately they are run in a terrible way the people who own them i'm told at worst there are students who pay their fees and one year later go and collect their degree without any training in the middle there are some institutes who give a little bit of training if this is how bad teacher training is how can we expect this sector to deliver quality education in the earlier days teachers were respected today they've lost that respect of society so why would anyone who has a conscience and doesn't want to acquire a degree in this way uh, want to go in for teaching i can't understand and in government schools with the unions once a teacher is in she or he can never be thrown out so they may not attend and their last asa report has been saying again and again that about 25% to t of teachers do not come to school they also it's gone so corrupt that some of the teachers have to pay the system a few lakhs to get in to make up that money they put a surrogate teacher and go and have another job so it's such a complicated lack of governance system that any one thing by itself will not help for example right to education has brought up the enrollment but has it improved the quality of education no not at all and i think india is in for huge huge problems if we do not put education and malnourishment solve these two problems with these two massive problems a demographic dividend is bound to be a disaster so i am very concerned up ahead uh, we're going to ask anu a day in her life what is it like being anu aga 94.3 radio 1 this is good morning mumbai and you're with rishi k radio 1 I'm with Anu Aga. She is my guest today, and we're having a really enlightening conversation for me because uh, it's such an eye opener. Everything that she is talking about. Uh, what is the day like uh, in the day of of An- Anu Aga? What time do you wake up? How much time do you devote to what? <laughs> okay, uh, you make me out to be such an important person. You are. I, I mean, am you, not. I am you're not. really an inspiration to a no, lot of people. I that's mean, very I, kind yeah, of you. Yeah. But I'm a human being like anyone else. Mm. Anyway. I don't have exactly a time when I have to get up but around 6 to 6:30 I get up and the first thing I do is my meditation for 1 hour. I do you follow any school or yes, the Vipassana the Buddhist meditation of course hmm. and I went for a short course in November did you go to Igatpuri yes and I realize I've been to four programs twice in Igatpuri once in America once in Bombay and this was the fifth three day one and i realized that doing meditation whenever i had the time is not the right way and i will make the effort of doing the first thing i get and i really find that helpful so the first thing is meditation then i have a very bad back it was operated upon so i need to do about 45 to 50 minutes of exercises related to my back if time permits a brisk half an hour to 40 minutes walk i would do Then if I am in Pune I would dress up and go to my office if I am in Delhi I go and attend the Rajya Sabha depends what I am doing on which day and then one thing or the other when I go to the office it's not to do thermax as well but my work which is uh, going through all the mail and the talks I have to give meeting people so I use my office space as a place where I can do my own personal work and uh, if i can i go over to my daughter and spend time with the family my granddaughter my grandchildren mean a heck of a lot to me and i love going to bed early if possible by 9:30 till what are you reading ma'am of late oh i love reading right now i'm reading pavan varma's chanakya and that's a fascinating book i would request all your people to read all your people who are listening to this Uh, Pavan was a foreign service officer who was an, an ambassador in Bhutan and he has written about 
what systems, what processes need to change in our country to have better governance and have a better democratic country. Right now we call ourselves a democracy, but we don't have a very good democracy. So how can we change this? Whether you agree or not, I think if people read and debate and talk about it and discuss it, I have a hope that things will change. One last leg of a conversation with Anu Aga on 94.3 Radio 1. Don't go anywhere. This is Good Morning Mumbai and you're with Rishi K. Radio 1. And I'm with Anu Aga. What a wonderful hour it has been of conversation. Uh, she's taken us through her life. Now, as far as holidays are concerned, which is the most memorable international holiday you've taken and a domestic India holiday that you've taken? Every year, uh, I try and take a holiday with my two grandchildren. Hmm. And wherever we go, that's memorable. <laughs> uh, really memorable. But uh, this November, I went with a group of nine ladies, nine or ten ladies to Iceland. Wow. And I loved it. Uh, this is one country where we didn't have to go through any security at the airports and uh, they don't have an army. Wow, and what I a peace-loving people. What yeah. a wonderful set of people. And we happened to be there on a first Saturday of November where they officially bring in winter. Wow. And they have a custom that in Reykjavik, which is the capital, the farmers bring lamb soup and distribute it free to the people and they have music and dancing on the street. It's a lovely country. People are friendly. They don't have very rich and very poor people. Landscape is stark. It's not pretty pretty, it's stark. I love the country. And domestically, which uh, do you remember last Beautiful. Uh, it's near Pune. We have a little house and I have wonderful memories of my family spending great time there going for walks. It's wonderful. You, you know, you do a Google on Anu Aga and then Wikipedia throws up numbers like one of the 10 richest ladies in Asia and things like that. From your expression, I can make out you're already embarrassed by this. But, you know, how, how much did wealth mean to you? How much does wealth mean to you? I mean, uh, at this point of time. Wealth gives me options. Mm. That's about all. But if I said with my wealth, I can't do this. I can't travel by public transport. I have to wear design clothes. Then my wealth is my golden chain. So I have never allowed wealth to limit my options to being an elitist person. To me, that's very important. Secondly, wealth gives me the responsibility to see that I use it not all for myself and my family, but for good causes. I think that option I love to be able to give to other people and to causes which I believe in. The future for Teach for India as well as Akanksha, where do you visualize it in the next generation or in, the, in a few years from now? In Teach for India, we have a vision that in 50 years, we'll be able to bridge the inequity gap. That's a very challenging vision, but I hope we can get there. I'm sure you will. Before you go, will you pick a song that you really like, which we can play for you? Any international uh, song, any English song that you really like? I like Angelo. Ah, of course. It's an old, my yes. daughter used to sing this song, <laughs> so it has a special uh, meaning for me. Anuaga, thank you very much for coming to 94.3 Radio 1. It was uh, so wonderful talking to you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.